Take your Bibles, turn over to John's Gospel, chapter 6. We are con- returning to our study of John's Gospel, and just to catch you up on what's been happening, here we have a map of the land of Israel. Israel basically can be divided into three sections. The lower section is known as Judea, the middle section known as Samaria, and the north section known as Galilee. Now our passage today takes place in the area of the Sea of Galilee, the part that is circled there, and I'll give you an enlarged view of that. Last time we saw Jesus has fed 25,000 people here at Bethsaida of Julius with just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And when he did this, the people immediately brought a connection, made a connection between Moses feeding manna to the children of Israel and Jesus giving them bread and fish on this occasion. So much so that They believed Jesus was the promised prophet that Moses had said would come, that God would send someday. And because they immediately thought he was that prophet, they wanted to make him king. They sought to seize him and to make him king. But Jesus knew it was not God's time or place for him to become king. And so what Jesus did, he escaped to the mountain to get away from the people, and to spend time in prayer. Now, he instructed his disciples to get in the boat and to go over to Capernaum. They got in the boat, but there was a tremendous storm coming, and though they had been rowing for several hours, they'd only gotten about halfway through, and then Jesus came walking on the water to to them. And they saw him and thought he was a ghost, and they were greatly afraid, But Jesus declares to them that He is the great I Am. He is the Yahweh of the Old Testament, the burning bush. He says, I Am. Do not be afraid. And immediately the storm stopped. He got in the boat and immediately the boat went to shore. I mean, it was like He overcame space and time and just immediately the boat had traveled several miles and was at the shore. So now they're at Capernaum. Well, the people come the next morning and they realize that Jesus has gone. And so they get in the boats that had blown up from Tiberias because of the wind and they come over to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And there we pick up our story in chapter 6, verse 26. Stand in respect for the Word of God as I read. Jesus answered and said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, and that's his word for miracles, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do? so that we may work the works of God. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. So they said to Him, What then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who's given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then he said, then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of Him who sent me. And this is the will of Him who sent me, 
that all that He has given to me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise Him up on the last day. You may be seated. And may God bless the reading and hearing, and most of all, the obeying of His Word. Now the Gospel of John has seven I am sayings of Jesus. This is the first one when He says, I am the bread of life. Now to help us understand this sermon that Jesus preached, we're going to put it in the context of three questions. First, what did Jesus mean when He calls Himself the bread of life? And then secondly, who can eat or partake of Jesus, the bread of life? And then thirdly, what will those receive who do eat of the bread of life? All right, first question. What did Jesus mean when in verse 36 He said to them, I am the bread of life. Now if we're going to understand this, then we must go back to the days of Jesus and talk about what bread meant to them in those days. Now obviously we know Jesus is speaking metaphorically. But bread in Jesus' day was the staple of life. Every culture throughout the ages has had one particular food that was considered the staple of that society, of that culture. Now when you think of China, what do you think about? Rice, okay? That's their staple. It's cheap. People can have it. They may not have anything else, but they will have some rice. Well, in Palestine, bread was that staple. They might not have anything else to eat, but if they had bread, they could live. You remember when the prophet Elijah had been sent by God to the wilderness for three years for God to bring a drought on Israel. You remember that? And he was by the brook Cherith, and he was drinking water from the brook, and ravens would bring him food. And then the brook dried up. So God told him to go in and speak to a widow lady of Zarephath. And he saw her and she was gathering up sticks. And you know what he said to her? Make me a piece of bread. You remember what she said to him? She said, I only have enough left to make one bread cake for my son and for me. And then we're going to die. All she had left was bread. And you remember the prophet said, make one for me first, and God will provide. She made one for him. God calls the oil to continue and the flour to continue, and she was fed. But the point I'm making is bread was the basic element. They had bread, and bread was important crucial for them to live. It was the sustenance of their life. If they didn't have bread, they would die. And when they didn't have anything else, they had bread. You remember when Naomi and Ruth came back from Moab, and they were poor, they didn't have anything, and you remember Ruth went and gleaned grain from the field of Boaz. You see, there was a law that God had made that when the reapers were reaping the grain, that when they dropped some, they had to leave it so the poor people could come and gather those fragments that were left to make bread so they wouldn't starve to death. The word Bethlehem means house of bread. And so without bread in their culture, they would die. When they didn't have anything else to eat, they would have some bread. It was life-giving to them. It was the most important thing in their physical life. They had to have bread and obviously water. Well, what's Jesus saying then when He calls Himself the bread of life? He is saying that I am the one who sustains spiritual life. Just as bread was their daily sustenance, what they needed 
to physically live. Jesus is saying, I am what you need to live spiritually. I am the true sustenance of life. And without me, there will be no life. He is the most important thing in our spiritual life. Just like bread was the most important thing in their physical life. They had to have it to live, to eat. Jesus is saying, I am the most important thing in your spiritual life. That you've got to have me if you're going to live spiritually and if you're going to be sustained spiritually. Now, I think we have a beautiful picture, a type of Christ as a bread of life over in the Old Testament in a story that's found uh, and has to do with Ezekiel, excuse me, has to do with Elijah again, when he's fleeing away from Jezebel, that wicked queen. You remember the Mount Carmel experience when uh, the prophets of Baal tried to bring down fire, and of course they couldn't, and Elijah calls on the God of Israel, Yahweh, and he brings down fire, and then they kill the prophets of Baal, well, Jezebel, a wicked queen, uh, she had been housing those prophets of Baal, so she was mad. She wanted to kill uh, Elijah, and so he fled from her. Well, he was so weary, he went to sleep. God woke him up, and an angel had put a bread cake there and beside him and said, take it and eat it. He ate the bread cake. Still weary, he fell back to sleep. A second time the angel woke him up, there was another bread cake there that God had provided. He said, take and eat, for your journey is long. He ate the second bread cake, and he went 40 days and 40 nights in the strength of that bread. Now, that's a picture of Jesus. That's a picture of Jesus. Supernatural bread. Just as that physical bread sustained him and carried him for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus is the one who sustains us and carries us spiritually through life. And so when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, He's saying, I am the very most important thing in your spiritual life. I am the thing that sustains. I am necessary for you to have spiritual life. That brings us to the second question. Okay, who can eat or partake of the bread of life? Now, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will not thirst. Well, who is it that can come to Jesus and partake of Him as the bread of life? Can anyone come to Jesus? Is this invitation open to everyone or just to certain people? Well, I think we need to let Jesus answer that question, don't you? And He does in this passage. Now what we have in this passage is Jesus is, has this marvelous blending of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. Now we've talked about that before from this pulpit, but we see it coming out in this passage. Now, you see if you can figure out which, what Jesus says pertains to God's sovereignty and what it is He says it pertains to man's responsibility. All right, who can come and eat of the bread of life? First, all those the Father gives him. All those the Father gives Jesus. Jesus says in verse 37, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. All those the Father has given me, Jesus says. Well, who has the Father given to Jesus is the question I naturally have, right? Who's he talking about? Well, I think Ephesians chapter 1 tells us when Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ just as He, God the Father, chose us in Him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in eternity past entered into what's known as the covenant of redemption. They came to an agreement 
The Father said, I will give you certain individuals of mankind to be your bride, and you will come and you will secure their salvation by your perfect life, by your death on the cross, by your resurrection. These are the ones whom I have given you. You say, well, how did God go about choosing them? Because He looked and saw that we were going to be good people? No. Totally according to His sovereign goodwill and pleasure. He just, because He wanted to show His love, He chose certain individuals to be of the Lord Jesus. Sometimes they're called the elect, sometimes they're called the chosen ones. But who they are are those that the Father has given to Jesus. He talks about this group again in John 17. This is His high priestly prayer. When he's Right before He's crucified, look at what He says. Jesus spoke these words, lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. He meant the hour of His crucifixion. Glorify Your Son, that Your Son may glorify You, even as You gave Him authority over all flesh. Now listen. That to all whom You have given Him, He may give eternal life. So you see, the Father has given an elect group of people, of mankind, before the world was even created, He chose a group of people to give to the Lord Jesus. Purely because of His grace. Unconditionally, not based on anything any one of those people would do. Just because of His love. And Jesus says, all those the Father has given me, they will come to me. They will partake of that bread. Now that's stressing God's sovereignty, is it not? Secondly, who can come to the Lord Jesus? All those that are drawn by the Father. Look at what Jesus says. Therefore the Jews were grumbling about Him because He said, I'm the bread that came down out of heaven. And they were saying, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does He now say, I have come down out of heaven? They're grumbling among themselves saying, who, who is this man? How can he say he's come from heaven when we know who his parents are? We know he grew up in Nazareth. Well, look at Jesus' response to them. Jesus answered and said to them, Do not grumble among yourselves. Well, why not, Jesus? Why shouldn't they grumble? Because no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You guys are arguing among yourselves, but God's not drawing you. That's why you don't see it. That's why you don't believe it. Because you're not being drawn by God the Father. But all those who are drawn by God the Father will come to Jesus. How does He draw? Jesus talks about that in verses 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. And everyone who has heard and learned from God does what? Comes to me. God gives you to the Lord Jesus. Then in His divine time, He draws you to Jesus. He teaches you through Jesus. He takes the Holy Spirit and He convicts you of your sin. That's His drawing. He convicts you of the righteousness of Christ. That's His drawing. He convicts you of the judgment to come that you stand under the wrath of a holy God that apart from Christ you will spend eternity in hell. That is His drawing. He opens your eyes to see spiritual truth. He works in your heart that your heart just starts desiring God. He opens the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Now, don't mistake this drawing of God as some Gentle wooing. Some people picture it like God saying, Come, come, please, please, come, come. Won't you come, please, please? That God's waiting, wringing His hands, waiting for you to come. That's not what Scripture teaches. You see this word draw? Jesus says, No man can come to His Father draws Him. John uses this word two other times in his Gospel. Now I want you to look at how he uses it. First time he uses it of Peter drawing his sword. You think Peter said, come on, come on, sword, come on. Or did Peter grab it and pull it out? This is when they were arresting Jesus. 
Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. And the slave's name was Malchus. You think he just wooed that sword out? Uh Uh-uh. He grabbed it and he pulled it. Another time John uses that same word is after Jesus' resurrection in John 21. And you remember they were out fishing and Jesus came on the shore and He said to them, Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat and you will find a catch. So they cast the net. Then they were not able to haul, and that word haul is the word draw, draw it in. Why? Because of the great number of fish. Now, what do you picture these fishermen doing with that huge haul? You think they're just saying, come on in, Nick, come on in. Or do you think they're grabbing and pulling it with everything they got? Jesus says, no man can come to me unless a father draws him. And God does it in such a way that you want to come. You want to come. (laughs) He can make you miserable. He doesn't have to violate your will. He can make you want to come. Right? You don't want any more of this pain. This, Lord, I want to come to you. Right? That's His drawing. That's Jesus bringing you to Himself. And so, everyone can come and will come to Jesus and partake of Him that the Father has given Him and that He draws. That stresses God's, respons- God's sovereignty, right? Well, let's balance it off now. What else did Jesus say? Everyone who beholds and believes in Jesus can come to Him. Again, in verse 28. Therefore He said to them, or they said to Him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in Him who He has sent. Now what were they asking Jesus? What can we do that we can do the work of God? They were saying, What can we do to earn salvation? What good work can we do that God will accept us and let us into heaven. That's what they're asking. They think they got to earn their salvation. And so Jesus says to them, guys, the work of God, and if you want to put quotations on work, is to believe in Him and in the Messiah that He has sent. That's not a work. Faith is a gift of God. The work of God can be understood in the original language to mean the work that God produces. And what is the work that God produces? Faith in Him and in the Lord Jesus. So Jesus said, hey, you don't work for salvation. You can't do anything to earn salvation. You can come to church every day of your life, pray every day and all day, read the Bible every day, and still go to hell. That's not how you get saved. He says what God requires is faith, belief in Him as the sovereign God of the universe and His Son Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, who died for the sins of His people and was raised again on the third day. You must place your complete confidence and trust in Him and what He has done. Look at verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in Him will have eternal life. If you behold Jesus as God's Son, if you behold Him as the Savior, means the one who came to accomplish what's necessary for you to have your sins forgiven, to remove the sin problem between you and God that you cannot remove, but He removed it because He took His sin, your sin upon Himself and was punished in your place. And God accepted that punishment because He raised Him from the dead. If you will behold and believe that Jesus accomplished this for you personally, then you have eternal life. It's that simple. Truly, truly, verse 47 I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. Oh, but but preacher, how do I know if I'm one of those that the Father has given to Jesus? How do I know if the Father is drawing me, do you believe? Do you believe in Jesus? Have you placed your confidence and trust in Him and Him alone? 
Have you abandoned all your own self-efforts and works to earn salvation and to be right with God? Have you laid all those down and said they're nothing but filthy rags and looked and grabbed hold of Jesus and said, Jesus, you are my hope. You're my hope for salvation. What you did is what I cling to and believe in. Well, if you believe that, you have been drawn by the Father. That's His drawing that enables that. So who can partake of this bread of life? Those the Father has given to the Son. Those the Father draws. And everyone who beholds and believes in the Son. And then, number four. He who eats Jesus' flesh and drinks His blood. Look in verse 54. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. Now what's Jesus talking about? He's not talking about cannibalism, obviously. He's speaking again, symbolically, metaphorically. And I think He explains what He means just a few verses down. And Look at verse 55. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. And he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, does what? Abides in me, and I in him. Jesus says, to eat my flesh and drink my blood means you abide in me. You remain in me, and I remain in you. He talks about this again over in, over in the other gospel, over, excuse me, over in this gospel in chapter 15, he talks about that. Well, let's look at it a moment. What happens... When you eat something. You know, there was a book that came out several years ago that said, you are what you eat. <laughs> I'm looking at some mighty powerful eating going on here among some of you. <laughs> and myself. You are what you eat. What? What does that mean? Well, when you eat something, what does it do? It gets down into your digestive system. And you know what? It sends those nutrients out into your body, even to the furthest cells. That's why you are what you eat. It gets assimilated into your body. When Jesus says, eat my flesh, drink my blood, He's saying, let me permeate every aspect of your being. Just like your food permeates your physical being to the smallest cell, let me permeate you to the deepest part of your spiritual being. To eat me and to drink my flesh is to take me into yourself and I am your everything. I come into the innermost part of your being and I am your very life. Abide in me and I in you. And how do we abide in Him? John tells us if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Jesus said. How do you abide in Jesus? You let His Word abide in you. He is the Word of God, you know. Let His Word, stay in the Word, study the Word, memorize the Word, live the Word, obey the Word, and hey, you got the Word living inside of you. Jesus. That's what it means to eat of His flesh and drink His blood. It means to allow Him to enter into the innermost being, your innermost soul, and for Him to fill it with His presence. That's what it means. All right, let's review. Who can eat of the bread of life? All those the Father has given to the Lord Jesus. All those that are drawn by the Father to Jesus. Everyone who beholds and believes in Jesus. Everyone who takes Jesus into the deepest part of His being as His personal Lord and Savior. That's what it means to eat of the bread of life. And what do those receive who do this? Oh, it just gets better. First, they have eternal life. He says over in verse 40, This is the will of my Father, that everyone who believe, beholds the Son and believes in Him will have what? Eternal life. You'll have eternal life. Remember, eternal life is the quality of life. It literally, in the Greek, is life of the age to come. Now, what's the age to come? Heaven. The age of ages is heaven. And when John says eternal life, he's speaking of a quality of life, not a duration. He says that you will have heaven life. You can have heaven life right now. You don't have to wait till you die. You can experience heaven right now. Now, Jesus defined eternal life. 
He says, eternal life is to know thee the only true God and Him whom He has sent. He's talking about an intimate personal relationship with Him. So to have eternal life is to know God intimately and personally. That's what heaven's all about. Entering into that deep relationship with God for eternity. Verse 654, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And then again, as Jesus said, eternal life is to know you. And that word know doesn't mean just head knowledge. It means much more. It means a personal, intimate love relationship with Jesus. That's eternal life. To eat His flesh and to drink His blood is to know Him intimately, personally, in a loving relationship. So the first thing you get, mm, you get eternal life. You get a quality of life. You get Jesus living in you mm, and you knowing Him and Him knowing you. But you also get everlasting life. Now, here the stress is on the duration of it. You will live forever. Jesus said in verse 51, I'm the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. So it will go on forever. That's the good thing about this eternal life, this quality of life, is it never ends. It will go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and on and ever. Never stop this quality of life, this love relationship with Jesus, because that's what Jesus said eternal life was, right? It will go on forever and ever and ever and ever. As he says in verse 58, This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died, but he who eats this bread will live forever. So first, those who partake of the Lord Jesus will have eternal life, heaven life, and they will have it forever. Thirdly, he says they will not hunger or thirst. Verse 35, Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. Now what's Jesus saying? Jesus says, he's speaking again metaphorically of spiritual hunger and thirsting. He says, I will give you true soul satisfaction. Come and partake of me and you will know a sense of soul contentment and peace that you will never know any place else. And you know what I'm talking about. Every one of you do. Because you see, we're all made to worship God. He made us that way. I don't care where you live, where you were born, He was creating within you a vacuum, a hole, a yearning, a desire to worship Him. Now, people don't recognize that. They just know they got this yearning inside. They just know they got this emptiness that they're wanting to satisfy. It's, just, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a craving. that it, it, It's just gnawing at you. And so they try all different things. You know, they, they think, well, if I just get enough money, then I will be satisfied. Some of the most miserable people in the world are the richest people in the world. Money won't do it. You think, well, if I can just get enough things around me, if you're a guy, if I can get enough toys around me, if I can get enough boats and get enough guns and get enough cars and, and get enough computers and enough tablets and gadgets and all this stuff, then I'll be satisfied. But you get it and you aren't satisfied. Well, if I can just rise up in my company and be the president, if I can just be the best at what I do, that will solve this and satisfy this deep yearning. But it doesn't happen. Women think, well, if I could just get married, then I'll have this yearning satisfied, and you get married, and it doesn't satisfy. Well, if I could just have children, and then that will satisfy this yearning. And you have children, and you still have that deep yearning. Some people say, well, if drugs is the answer, and I'll go out and take drugs and, and get that yearning, but it still comes back. Some people think, well, if I can just have enough sex, then that will satisfy the yearning. But you know what? It still comes back. There's only one solution to that yearning that we all have deep down. That desire to be content, to be satisfied. And that's Jesus. He who comes to me will not hunger or thirst. The only answer to your soul's need for true contentment, 
True satisfaction is to come to Jesus and partake of him and have him come into your life and penetrate to the innermost part of your being. Now Jesus uses a double negative in this verse. When he says, I am the bread of life, he who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never, no, never thirst. Come to him, you will never, no, never hunger. You will never, no, never thirst. And if you say, well, I'm a Christian, but I still hunger, well, then you need to come to Jesus fully. You, you're not feasting on Jesus. That's your problem. You're still trying to keep one hand in the world and one hand in the spiritual kingdom. And you can't do it. You've got to go wholeheartedly for Jesus. And any time you get away from Jesus, that knowing comes back because Jesus says, I'm the only one. You're not going to find it anywhere else. When are you going to learn? Only in Jesus. And then fourthly, what will you receive when you come to Jesus? Oh, assurance of your salvation. Hallelujah. This is the will of Him who sent me, that of all that He has given to me, I lose only a few. Is that what it says? Oh, it doesn't say that. Oh, it doesn't, does it? I lose nothing. Nada. Zilch. Zero. None. Jesus says, all those the Father has given to me and come to me, I don't lose any of them. Every last one of them I will raise up on the last day. <laughs> if he's got a hold of you, he doesn't let go. You know, I, I, it's that trapeze grip. I don't know if you've ever noticed trapeze artists, but, you know, they don't grab like this. They grab like this, right? So if one of them loses, the other one's still got it. Well, let me tell you, Jesus has got a hold of you like this. Now, you may, you may slip and, and, and your grip might let go, but let me tell you, he doesn't let go. He's got you. He's got you. And he's going to keep you. If it depended on us, well, we, we, we would be gone. But it depends on him and his faithfulness. Jesus says, I lose nothing. And then he says, they will be resurrected on the last day. Whew. Now, Jesus stresses this over and over and over again in these short verses. Look at how many times he repeats his phrase, will raise him up on the last day. Verse 39. This is the will of him who sent me, that of all he's given to me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. And then in verse 40. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And look at this, emphatic. I myself will raise him up on the last day. And then again in verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And in verse 54, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. That's eternal security. That's the perseverance of the saints. Let me tell you, if you are truly saved, He's going to keep you saved, and when the day of resurrection comes, He's going to raise your body from the grave. And it's not going to be raised like it was put in, in weakness and in decay, but it's going to be raised in power. It's going to be raised in immortality. It's going to be raised after the glory of Jesus. That's what you receive when you come to Jesus. It's a win-win proposition, folks. When you come to Jesus, you will have eternal, everlasting life. You will have a deep soul satisfaction that you will find no place else. You will have assurance of your salvation because He will keep you saved and you will be resurrected on that last day. Hallelujah. Behold Jesus, the bread of life. Have you come to Jesus as your bread of life? Are you willing to turn away from anything in your life that's not pleasing to Him? Any relationship that might be sinful? Any habits? And come to Him and partake of Him as your all in all? Now, He doesn't say you have to give it up the sin first because you cannot give it up on your own. But come to Him, be willing, and He will give you the power. 
But do you want Jesus more than you want anything today? Do you think I can't, I cannot and will not live another day without Jesus as my Lord and Savior? If that's your heart's desire, when we sing this next song, would you just come down? Let me know that. He is drawing you. Come down and you can walk away from here a new creature in Jesus Christ. Don't walk away from here without Jesus being your bread of life. This is your opportunity. This is the day of salvation. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not even promised this afternoon. The only moment you know you have for sure is this one right now. Right now. Let's pray. We do welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet. And I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team. Uh, this is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our minister of community connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area, uh, and it doesn't matter what race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcomed at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.